So our next session is session six, and it is our final session for the day. It will be focusing on expanding training and integration of palliative care globally. Please join me in welcoming our session chair, uh, Dr. Kim Lee Ashin. So uh, Dr. Ashin is the deputy director of the decision, uh, Division of Health Equity, Associate Cancer Center Director for the Community Outreach and Engagement, Funding Director of the Center for Community Alliance for Research and Education, and also Professor in the Department of Population Sciences at Beckman Research Institute. Dr. Ashin obtained her PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Colorado and was awarded a fellowship to conduct AIDS research at UCLA by Fogarty International. Dr. Ashin is a notable leader in examining health disparity, cancer in education, survivorships, and quality of life. She holds several national leadership roles within the African Caribbean Center Consortium and National Advisory Council for the Asian Pacific Islander Native Hawaiian Cancer Survivor Network. And uh, without further ado, I'll pass the floor to you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Kimlin Tam Ashing, professor at City of Hope and um, Associate Cancer Center Director for Community Outreach and Engagement. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Betty Farrell on our um, panel today. She is Director and Professor in the Division of Nursing Research and Education at City of Hope. She's been in nursing for, listen to this, 45 years. She started as an infant and has focused on her clinical expertise and research on pain um, management, quality of life, and palliative care. She has over 480 publications in peer-reviewed journals, several books, including the Oxford um, Press textbook on palliative nursing. She's principal investigator of the End of Life uh, Nursing Education Consortium, LNEC. She directs several um, NIH and foundation funded grants. She's co-chairperson of the National Consensus Project on Quality um, Palliative Care. Dr. Farrell um, has been named as one of the 30 visionaries in the field by the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. In 2019, she was elected as a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Last year, she received the Oncology Nursing Society Lifetime Achievement Award and was inducted as a living legend by the American Academy of Nursing. Let's welcome Dr. Farrell. Thank you very much. It's uh, really so wonderful to be part of this global symposium and certainly Kimlin to work with you is always a treat. So I'm very happy to be a part of this panel today and. Again, I was just so excited to see City of Hope um, sponsor this global event because there is such important work that we, many people at City of Hope are a part of. And so what I'll be sharing with you today is the work that I've been doing for a little over 20 years and uh, through our project LNEC, and I'll be telling you about that. But definitely, as you've already heard today, there is such an enormous need for palliative care globally that uh, we need outstanding cancer care throughout the world. And part of that is the supportive care that patients need with symptom management and quality of life concerns, which has been our focus. Next. So the uh, project that I'm really uh, going to share is the umbrella for all of this work is our end of life nursing education consortium project. And this is a project that began 22 years ago and our focus has been training and mentoring of nurses in palliative care around the world. Much like Janine, you just heard from Janine, um, around the world, wherever we go, you know, people are gonna send their clinicians. And so we often have physicians and other disciplines attend the training programs, which has been wonderful. And this is just a few of the publications that have come from that work uh, from Eastern Europe, from India, um, from, uh, South Korea, just some examples. Next. So LNEC is uh, this project, the End of Life Nursing Education Consortium, and it is a collaboration with City of Hope and the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. And so when we started 22 years ago, we realized that it would be valuable to have as a partner, AACN is a leading voice in nursing for nursing education. And so we're really honored to have them as our partner, and it's really valuable as we go around the world and try to encourage nursing education in this area. Next. 
uh, this is where we started. And so this is in the year 2000. And so you can probably pick out a few faces here and then you will realize how long we've been doing this work when you see how young we were when we started. And so uh, some of you may know Marcia Grant, who is in the center of the slide with me and uh, our department chair at City of Hope when we started and Rose Verani, who was a nurse at City of Hope for more than 40 years and retired last year. So uh, we started in the year 2000 to create a curriculum to educate nurses in the United States. When we first started, we really didn't plan on doing international work, but as soon as we launched our first course, we began to get queries from around the world or nurses coming to us from around the globe saying, we need this also in our countries. And so we started with a U.S. focus, but have now expanded as I'll be sharing a little bit more. Next. Uh, in terms of what do we teach, you know, what are we teaching around the world? Our content addresses the key domains of palliative care. And so in the United States, uh, much like many of you are familiar with NCCN guidelines for cancer care, well, there are national guidelines for palliative care, and they're called the National Consensus Project Guidelines. And these guidelines lay out what is the essential content? What do people need to know to deliver the highest quality palliative care? And so probably, you know, no surprise, the general overview of what is palliative care, pain management, symptom management, ethical issues, cultural and sp spiritual care, communication, loss and grief, and final hours. And so our curriculum mirrors the national guidelines so that we are preparing people uh, to deliver the kind of palliative care that has been accepted as really quality care. Next. The, um, there are many sources around the world that have documented the very critical need for improved palliative care. This is from the World Health Organization, a recent uh, publication, the Global Atlas of Palliative Care. And again, we could spend many hours describing the global needs, the lack of opioids in many countries, the lack of any palliative care specialization, the need for uh, many other medications for symptom management. Um, there are so many needs, but again, well documented by groups such as WHO. Next. Um, the, some of the statistics from the Global Atlas, almost 57 million people, patients and families need palliative care. And then again, these statistics you know, point to the fact that um, many of those are children, that only a small percent of these needs are being met. Many of these patients are at the end of life. Um, many of these countries have very low provision of palliative care and that there's just so much that we can do. Um, and of course, these needs are dramatically increasing. Next. This is also a recent paper, a group that I was a part of that published this year. Uh, a paper on optimizing the global nursing workforce to ensure universal palliative care across uh, all of these countries. And so we had you know, people from around the world who have become part of this uh, worldwide discussion about how to improve palliative care. And we're really, really proud to be a part of that work. Next. Uh, this is one more paper, just to give you an example, the Lancet Commission um, focused on the value of alleviating suffering and dignifying death in war and humanitarian crises. So we often are thinking of cancer or illness, but there's also been a focus on the opportunities for palliative care to assist in war and humanitarian crises around the world, which we have certainly seen in the many countries that we have served. Next. The, uh, we are always interested in underserved communities, whoever those might be, this is, you know, again, a paper, um, some of the projects we've participated in, for example, palliative care for LGBT people in the time of COVID, uh, palliative care for those experiencing homelessness in the time of COVID. And so all of these issues, of course, have become even more prominent during the last years during the pandemic. Next. Um, we have also participated in things such as the Global Palliative Care and Pain Relief uh, Research Hub and the conferences held by Memorial Sloan Kettering. So it's very exciting to see City of Hope's involvement because many other cancer centers have been actively involved in global 
cancer care and certainly global palliative care. Next. So as I mentioned, we started, LNEC started uh, 22 years ago with the focus on the US, but very quickly the demand was to expand globally. And uh, we now, LNEC has had a presence in 101 countries as of this year, and that covers six continents. And uh, our project is a train the trainers approach, meaning when we host our courses, we are, our intention is to deliver the content to help people understand how to manage pain or symptoms or bereavement, but also how to teach other people. And so all of our train the trainer courses, we send people home prepared to train, to teach others, to share the information. So we currently have over 45,000 trainers have been trained around the world. And those trainers uh, have collectively reached 1.4 million clinicians. And so we're really just constantly amazed ourselves at just the wonderful work of our trainers in expanding palliative care knowledge. Our curriculum has also been translated in 12 different languages and, uh, and more to come. And so um, that's also been wonderful to see countries uh, adapt the curriculum and translate so that it can be shared within uh, languages around the world. Next. I'll just kind of move through some of our work across different countries to illustrate the reach. This is some of our translations. Next. Um, again, you can see the, the languages are widely varied and truly all around the globe. Next. Um, and now I'll just kind of do a quick review to show you the places around the world that we have done uh, training, that there's some presence of ELNIC and uh, first beginning with work in Africa, which began in the year 2007. You can see many African countries involved and we uh, currently uh, maintain a lot of work in uh, Kenya. We've done a lot of work in Tanzania, um, many participants from Uganda, uh, support in Swaziland. And I'll say a little bit more later about our collaboration with Dr. Leslie Taylor in uh, Ethiopia. Next. Uh, this is again from some of our earliest work and as, uh, as you just heard from uh, Dr. Brandt's presentation, um, we try in each of these countries to work with schools, to foster integration of education, to work with government officials and local health authorities and volunteers because in many countries actually these are faith-based organizations or volunteer groups that are supporting palliative care efforts. Next. Um, this is one of our primary collaborators has been in Kenya uh, through it's called Living Room International, a major hospice and palliative care program. And we've really worked with them to, again, be a national leader uh, so that they can carry out the training and we are there to mentor and to support them. And that's been really wonderful work and they're a great organization. Next. In Asia, we've reached 27 Asian countries with our ELNIC presence. Our first training there started in the year 2007. So you can see many countries next. And some of the key activities in Japan, our first training started there in the year 2008. And uh, Japan has really adopted ELNIC in a big way. They, there is now a whole ELNIC Japan operation, which is organized as a part of the Japanese Society for Palliative Medicine, over 2,900 trainers in Japan, and over 48,000 people trained in Japan thus far. Um, the picture in the middle is right before COVID, a few months before COVID began, I had the pleasure of traveling to Japan to participate in the 10th anniversary celebration of ELNEC Japan. And what I'd like to just mention here is that while Japan is a country with a lot of resources, unlike many countries, the cultural changes. The first time I ever visited Japan uh, more than 20 years ago was at a time where they would not say the word death. There was absolutely no sharing with patients, uh, diagnoses. There was no discussion of prognoses. It was absolutely forbidden to tell a patient that they would die. And so it's been remarkable to see the uptake of palliative care in Japan and the cultural changes that come along with that. So we're some amazing people we work with in Japan. Next. We've also done a, a lot of work in South Korea, again, a country that's translated all of our curricula. 
And again, I mentioned that Elnik in this country has also found a home in now being a part of the Korean Hospice and Palliative Nursing Network, um, which is embedded within the, the larger overall palliative care organization. So we really love to see when Elnik finds its way into a more permanent home so that the training continues even if we have not been uh, present in some time, the work continues and the leadership is developed. Next. Um, this is some of our uh, a little more recent work. The first training started in India in the year 2009 and Elnik India is now a, a work of its own and is now being provided through the Institute of Medical Science, uh, adapted to India by local educators, funded through the CIPLA Foundation. There are four nursing schools that have integrated ELNIC throughout their curriculum and eight ELNIC India training sites as of 2022 and uh, extending this fall to Sri Lanka. So uh, in just about a month, we are launching a 10 session palliative care training that's provided through an open university. And so wide distribution plan throughout the country um, beginning very soon. And we're really excited to see the work extend. And all of you, of course, are very aware of the palliative care needs in India and Sri Lanka. These are countries that are just enduring so much um, disease and political unrest and instability. And so uh, the palliative care is so needed. Next. We've also had a long-term collaboration in the Philippines. Our first training started in 20. Uh, 2009, and we've had 14 summits and courses. There are two major collaborators there, the Ruth Foundation and nonprofit home-based service and global pain specialist um, doing a lot of the inpatient palliative care work. And so long-term colleagues and just incredible, amazing work in the Philippines. Next. Uh, Singapore has actually a very well-established palliative care program and education. And our first training started there in the year 2014. And again, we've been honored to go and help develop further. But uh, this is an example of country with you know, well-developed and wonderful uh, palliative care through their national health plan. Next. Um, our work in China began in the year 2015. We started collaborating the first ELNIC core training in China with 53 oncology nurses. And now ELNIC is being taught across various provinces in China and sponsorship with the Oncology Committee of the Chinese Nurses Association. ELNIC is carrying out an ELNIC pediatric course in about two weeks from now. And they had planned an entire summit where we run all of our ELNIC courses together, um, but that has been postponed until next year. So the work in China is growing dramatically. We can hardly keep up with it, but again, a country that has tremendous needs for palliative care. Next. Um, Australia and uh, Oceania area, these are some of the countries. Um, I'll be going back in January where we're uh, going both our core and our pediatric training to Australia. So very excited for collaboration. Next. Uh, throughout Europe, we've had very extensive work in 35 countries uh, with ELNIC presence. Our first training began in the year 2006. And again, this has been a major focus of all of our ELNIC work. So go to the next slide. We've had the opportunity to work very closely in Europe because of our collaboration uh, with the Austrian Medical Society. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, the Austrian Medical Society has a um, training center, a building that was donated to them, and they, they converted this building to be a um, continuing medical education. So in 2011, we started the first training and, um, and have then recognized Romania as a tremendous leadership potential. And so we've trained them in our palliative care program so that between our visits, they are carrying out and leading the efforts throughout the region. Next. Again, uh, this is from Austria and Romania, our leadership development there. Next. And Hungary, another country, 75% of healthcare professionals are now being educated in hospice and palliative care. And again, this is embedded with the Hungarian Hospice and Palliative Care Association. Very wonderful group there. Next. Uh, many North American countries have been a part of ELNIC training. Next. 
and South America. So our first training there, uh, 2010 in eight countries with ELNIC presence. Next. And country 101, we reached earlier this year, our first ELNIC course held in Haiti. Again, you can all imagine not only ongoing chronic illness, end of life care needs, but these countries that have often been hit with hurricanes and uh, many other disasters and such a need for supportive care. Next. Um, so, oops. Uh, also, in addition to hosting all of these ELNIC training courses, we have tried to participate with colleagues to integrate ELNIC within other global initiatives. And so I know Dr. Taylor presented earlier today, the City of Hope Ethiopia Breast Cancer Initiative. And so we've been working closely together to share our curriculum so that our work in palliative care is being integrated into the overall breast initiatives in Ethiopia. Next. And uh, again, this is from, uh, from the work that's happening, the Hawassa uh, Cancer Hospital, and we're involved with the first training of oncology nurses there. Next. These are some of the leaders that have worked with Dr. Taylor. Um, well, amazing, amazing colleagues to work with. We're very excited to be implementing there. Next. The nursing education program we're designing there includes development of master's and PhD program, bi-directional education and research opportunities, and uh, then to be implemented in other sub-Saharan African countries for future collaboration. Next. And also we're uh, supporting some of the master's students in their research thesis. They're doing very, very impressive, important studies in the areas of breast cancer and palliative care. Next. Uh, in addition to all of our in-person training courses, um, LNIC also has online learning through Relias is our learning management system. And so we run these courses and these have also been helpful to access by our international colleagues. Next. And we have a major focus on schools of nursing. So. We have over 900 undergraduate programs in the U.S., about 350 graduate programs in the U.S. using our curriculum and now beginning to work with all of the countries that we have affiliations to also help them integrate palliative care within their curriculum. Next. So this is our website. ELNIC uh, is our website is hosted through the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. And so you can get a lot more information there and a lot more information about our international work, and then also our contact at City of Hope. And so we're always glad to share any information. There's quite a bit of information on our website um, about uh, LNEC and about our work internationally, if you want to get more information there. So I think that's the end of my slides and we'll stop there. And I think we have just a few minutes. Oh, I love, I, I did end with this last slide. This was something that, um, Dr. Taylor shared with me uh, earlier, and I think you heard from Dr. Brand as well, that you know, doing international work is sometimes a challenge and there are certainly barriers to overcome, but this was a picture sent uh, to Dr. Taylor recently from our colleagues there showing the, the work of the women hauling lumber and uh, as a way of feeding their family to, to sell the lumber. And so I thought this was really, a beautiful image and I sort of ended by saying the burden and the beauty of international collaboration that um, while it's a tremendous effort and commitment we certainly learn uh, so much from our colleagues and there's just nothing more um, wonderful than to see uh, uh, the work that our colleagues are doing around the world so it is a tremendous tremendous honor to do this work. So now we will formally introduce Dr. Brand. So she is Executive Director of Clinical Science and Innovation at City of Hope. She's an oncology clinical nurse specialist, scientist, and president of the Oncology Nursing Society. Dr. Brand's work includes symptom management and pain research. Um, and so she's been at the forefront of this area, both nationally and as you've heard internationally, she's published over 150 books and um, papers on palliative care, pain and symptom management. Um, and as you've seen, her work, uh, recent work focuses on the Middle East. 
Well, I'm going to talk about um, a palliative care program I've been involved in since 2008, and it's primarily from the Middle East and really talks about promoting change from within the country. Um, and you can introduce me later in, in lieu of time, so thank yes. you. So this program, um, it's actually started during the Clinton administration. And at the time, Bill Clinton's mother was dying of cancer, and she had asked him to do something in her memory and legacy. And so at the time, the head of the Department of Health and Human Services was from Lebanon, and she wanted to impact a part of the world. And apparently there were a lot of people in the Middle East with cancer. They had a lot of resources, but many people were dying early from the disease. And so they started what's called the Middle Eastern Cancer Consortium. And at the time, Professor Michael Silberman right here was the um, at the DHHS. And so he was asked by the Clinton administration to lead this initiative. He was actually a professor from Israel. So that original treaty, he gathered together six different countries from the Middle East, and uh, you can see them on the screen there, and they actually signed a treaty in Geneva, Switzerland, in front of the World Health Organization. And it really started an initiative where their primary goal was to develop an infrastructure for clinical trials. Well, that was fairly successful, but what they recognized is people were dying from the disease still. They were being diagnosed very late. And so they started to really look more closely at palliative care and the inequities of pain, suffering, and dying. And so we started the palliative care initiative, and it was in 2008 I attended the first course on the influence of pain and suffering um, and religion on spirituality, suffering, all of those things. And Professor Silberman was there where I met him at the time. We also had collaborators through the Oncology Nursing Society in ASCO. So that is how I got involved. So through 20 years of funding, we had almost 20 years of funding. And actually, funding stopped closer to 2017. I was just re-looking at that. And at that time, um, the Oman Cancer Association assumed kind of the leadership and the funding for this initiative. This is Uther. She is, um, was on the parliament with the Sultan. She's a breast cancer survivor and her husband, Dr. Wahid Al-Harusi, he actually spearheaded some of the leadership along with Professor Michael Silberman to continue these palliative care courses. And to this day, this initiative is funded through the Oman Cancer Association. And Professor Silverman, who we still call the father of palliative care in the Middle East, continues to be involved from Israel. Interestingly, um, it was also a peacekeeping mission in the sense that it brought people from various religions and beliefs together. We nominated Professor for the Nobel Peace Prize a couple of years back. Donna Shalala submitted the award, and we had almost 50 letters of support from Muslim people supporting a Jewish professor. So it really shows how this is about people and relationships. So as far as the scope of where we're looking at, um, the primary part of the training has been taking place in the um, Middle East. We've mostly focused right here in Oman. That was the original training in 2013. We did do a focused course with Iraq and Iran in Ankara, Turkey. Then we went back for another cohort here and we started pulling in Northeast Africa, Egypt, Sudan, Kenya, um, Tanzania is what they call it, Zambia. So we pulled some of these countries in. We also replicated this course um, through Professor Silverman's collaboration in China with the Psychosocial Oncology Society of China. And as you see now, we're actually headed to Zanzibar again in January, and we're there in August as well. So one of the most important foundations of this program, and I think Betty will mention this maybe as well, is having a really strong um, mentor program. And the, the individuals who go from the United States, and we've taken a lot of different people, we've mentored a lot of people, but they really have to be flexible. We sometimes change agendas on a whim. We always remind ourselves it's about the participants, what they're getting out of this. And 
sometimes the groups are a little bit different than we anticipate. So we really kind of ebb and flow the content. So flexibility and also the ability to be approachable where we're relational, we can connect with people, we can connect with groups, and then we can facilitate group activities because um, the types of workshops we offer are very interactive. And actually I brought my daughter, she's a nurse here at City of Hope on the transplant unit. She was a nursing student at the time. So she's come with me twice. So here's what it looks like. It's a five part series that that was our US faculty. We start right here with the foundations of palliative care course. And when we went to Oman in 2013, we had all of the Middle Eastern countries, about 19 of them have representatives to this foundational course in Oman. Then the next course, about six months later, we taught advanced palliative care. Then we went on to palliative care leadership and then advancing palliative care through research and evidence-based practice. We did that whole series again in Iran and Iraq. Then we came back and as we did this, we watched people emerge as leaders. And oftentimes in courses, these leaders will emerge that really take an initiative. So we actually selected leaders, picked them by hand, one from each of the countries, and then a, a group of them from Oman. We could do more Omanis because that's where the training was held and they were local. And we took them through a train the trainer course on presentation skills, group facilitation. The, these trainers also brought another person from their country to take the class. So like Rahana brought, for example, Shanila from Pakistan so that she could mentor somebody in her own country to be a leader, but then we're also emerging them. They ended up training the second cohort through the series and we were there with them as they taught the class. We gave them feedback on their um, delivery skills, on their facilitation skills. We cheered them on and we really encouraged them along the way. Here's a couple of sample agendas, but I, I didn't show the palliative care course because those are, are pretty standard. But what's different is our engagement activities that I'll show you in a minute. But for leadership, though, we even think about regional leadership challenges. What about opioid availability in their specific regions? How do you open a palliative care unit? What are the barriers? What are the facilitators? They also choose a project. It could be an education project, a QI, a research study. Do they want to write a proposal to their Ministry of Health to increase opioid availability? How do they communicate that? How do they deliver? Oops. And then finally, the research. We actually conduct a research study with them. We do a compassion fatigue study. They all do surveys. We analyze it together. We do mock IRB and we run them through the research process. At the end, they present their projects. Oftentimes these are group projects and we see a lot of creative ideas emerge. So the, the three things I wanna focus on is how we engage people, how we equip them and how we send them. So first of all, how we engage them. I think this is one of the most important things of the teaching is the cohort model. Each of the facilitators then they take a cohort of nurses, as you see here, we um, do group activities together, we do case studies, they do improvs, you'll see some of the things we do, conversation cafes, we compete for games, we even have music presentations and kind of a talent show at the end that really showcases different countries, you know, um, musical celebrations and fun things. So creating a cohort is really important. We also get to know everybody's name. So each facilitator takes pictures of the name badges. We study them at night and this is serious business. I cannot tell you when you call somebody by name and they're recognized as an individual, they really glow, they light up. Um, some of the shyest people have come alive in groups because we're trying to build them as future leaders in their countries. We're trying to recognize every voice that attends um, and everybody 
is valued. So we really work to get to know them as individuals. We also spend time together. And I was just hearing Betty saying, you eat together, do everything. We're together with these people 24 hours a day. One of the most fun experiences was we went camping in the desert and we had a big group that time. We had extra meetings. So we had we had some people from NCI who were there. We had Beth Mugo. She's the uh, senator in Kenya. She's a breast cancer survivor. We had the Egyptian minister of health there. So we had a lot of dignitaries and we went camping in the desert. So a lot of this work is about building relationships that are lasting and that create sustainability in the region. We eat together. You can see some of the good food. Of course, this is a dish from China. This is one of our favorite restaurants in Turkey where we go and, you know, we celebrate eating together and just sharing life together. The next thing I'll talk about is how we equip people. So in addition to didactic lectures, we have what we use, what we use is um, called liberating structures. And these are really structures based out of complexity science where we're not the keepers of knowledge, yet we recognize that the ability to change, the ability to mobilize palliative care in these regions really comes from those thought leaders within each of those countries. And so one of the things we do is conversation cafe. We talk about what are the barriers in their community to, to launching palliative care initiatives? You know, what's their community perspective? What's the relationship between nurses and physicians? I'll never forget at the end of the week when we were having take-homes and a Chinese physician said, I had no idea that my nurses knew so much. Going forward, I'm going to ask my nurses for their, for the involved, you know, for them to help make decisions about patient care. So really changing people's perspectives as they work as groups together and listen to one another. This is called a TRIZ. We use it for symptoms and different things. We say, what can you do to get the worst possible outcomes? So for example, a patient with dyspnea, you might lie them down on their back, put them in a hot room. Um, it, this backwards way of thinking helps us to identify some of the things that we might actually do that we need to improve. There's a lot of humor with this and a lot of fun, and it creates kind of a memorable um, experience. Open space, and these agendas are risky. I can tell you, we put pieces of paper in the room and people suggest topics. So they say, I wanna talk, to, I wanna do a project on pain. I wanna do a project about increasing opioid availability, or I wanna open a palliative care unit. So this is Bill All. He was doing one on pain. And so he facilitates a board on projects. And then other participants can wander and choose the group that they want to talk with. But this way, the agenda is driven by the participants instead of by the presenters. So again, you're really allowing emergence within the community. Uh, this is improv. We do bad examples and good examples of communication. And we'll say, okay, what was that? And they'll say, bad example. So, you know, they have fun with those. We ask for actors last minute. They jump in. It's amazing. Building trust early and getting people to engage early can really create a week-long environment of fun. And these encounters are all one week long. Celebrity panel is really tapping into expertise within the community, having them reflect on their own experiences, what's culturally relevant in their situation so that we can share knowledge. And then finally, we send them. Here's our oncology nursing ambassadors from the first cohort. And I'll tell you a couple of their stories because I think their stories are really powerful. This is Rehana. Rehana was... Um, a very quiet nurse from Pakistan, and I did meet her in, in 2013. She's a pediatric oncology nurse, and one of the struggles she had was splitting doses of morphine because once they ran out, they had to reorder it from the Ministry of Health, and then it took a month to get the new stock. So the nurses had creatively stockpiled morphine so that they would have enough for the children that last month. 
hearing that, she ended up writing a full proposal to the Ministry of Health and changing the practice of how they will refill morphine availability in Pakistan. Last year, she was the International Pediatric Nurse of the Year. This is Miriam Rosselli. I met her originally at the Iran-Iraq encounter in Ankara, Turkey. And Miriam is a PhD and she they brought with them about 30 people that year. And there was a lot of unrest in the world, um, but they continued to come to this training. Miriam has served in the parliament, so she's really um, gotten some good recognition for her work. She's opened three palliative care units in Iran, and she is well published. A couple of years ago, she was the ONS International Nurse of the Year. And last week, she was just presenting at something globally, and she said, I attribute all of my experience and my success to Mac and Oka and the skills that I built, because again, she was very quiet, would barely say a word. This is Needle. He's a medical oncologist. So we do have physicians and pharmacists with this as well. And Needle, he, um, first time he went, he said, I'm having such a great time. Can you please go tell Dr. Wahid that I want to come again? And I said, Needle, you need to go and share that with him, with him yourself. And he says, well, I'm a little too nervous. Well, as he became a trainer, he also was reluctant to do some of the activities. I can tell you since that time, he stepped out of his comfort zone. This is him facilitating a fishbowl. He was like a game show host, we told him. He was impactful. He was clear. It built the confidence he needed. He is now a prominent figure on public TV in Palestine, talking about cancer awareness and increasing availability of resources in Pakistan. He just sent us another television clip last week. So pretty amazing. We do have other outcomes I could have listed, you know, that were on paper, different studies we've published. This paper kind of wraps up some of our work from the Journal of Cancer Education that was published last year. Like I said, in addition, we have several studies that we have signed on with of publications um, that you can access in the literature. Finally, we connect and we talked about this WhatsApp. We're on WhatsApp at least weekly. We're friends on Facebook, Instagram, and I think connecting and ongoing, it's like we cheer each other on. If someone's presenting, in fact, I just WhatsApped my colleagues to tell them I was talking about them and how proud I am of them. And so they all sent me little stickers and things. It was fun. Anyway, I have to tell you, this has been life changing for me. I couldn't think of anything I would rather be doing. And to watch the world grow and grow capacity in palliative care has been one of the greatest joys of my career. And um, again, we're still going. We're still hoping for funding and ongoing hope. And this is our wishing for the stars. So I'll stop with that. Thank you so much, Dr. Farrell and Dr. Brandt. I, I love that ending of the burden and beauty. So what are some of the key commonalities as well as some of the biggest differences across countries and cultures that you've worked with? No, well, I would say that the commonality is very interesting as we've gone into a lot of countries, we often, you know, the faculty were like, oh, you know, will, they, will this ethics information make sense to them? Or, you know, how do we teach pain management when their access to medicines is so different? But, you know, over and over, I would, I would say, we have so much more in common than we have different, the same principles apply. Um, we do try to do our homework and learn about the countries. We try to arrive in the countries early if we can to go into the villages, the homes, the clinics, the hospitals, so that we really see their reality and their patients, so that when we get into the classroom, we can really talk about their world and you know their issues. Um, it does require a lot of cultural humility because you know mm -hmm. we are not the experts in their countries. We are the guests. And uh, I loved what Dr. Brand had to say about flexibility because um, you know you go into a country and you may have a lovely syllabus and agenda, but you need to be prepared to change everything. And after our first few courses, we would always say, 
you know, we have five faculty. And what that means is one person is at the front of the room lecturing and the other four are in the back of the room trying to decide how to change everything from there. Because, you know, the topic that you thought would take an hour, they want to talk about for four hours. The content you prepared that you were sure would take three hours, they're done with in 20 minutes. Um, you know, so it's, it, that is a challenge, but it's also a lot of fun. And again, you know, we're there to serve. We're there to um, to live in their world momentarily, but to really to try to be of service to help them. And we have to listen to what how we can do that. And so um, it's it's a really really great work. Thank you. And this is for both of you. What are some of the differences that you see in terms of? palliative care um, training that's that's needed and, and sort of cultural values around pain? I would just say, you know, some of the differences are the roles of nursing and, you know, the, the roles of women. So, you know, we've been in many countries where it is really difficult to, uh, to see how women are still really undervalued and to see the role of nurses where Nurses are not practicing at all to the, you know, to the great extent that they could. And we have to have a great sensitivity about that. We try to, to be respectful of the realities where we go, but to also try to be advocates to help elevate the status of women and nursing everywhere we go in the world. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I think that's kind of, you know, been our, our primary experience in that area. Yeah, I agree with Betty. I think that's been some of the most rewarding parts of our work, though, too, is seeing physicians and nurses working together for the first time and having conversations and kind of creating that space for them to share. And I think looking at physician advocates for nurses have really helped to further the cause in a lot of the countries. Um, I think that's helpful. The other big thing is just like Betty said, starting from ground zero, that oftentimes physicians, nurses, they know nothing. And even if they've had a little bit of training, we think about ourselves as learners. Sometimes it takes learning it again and again um, in just some of the countries where still people are kept on the ventilator up until the time of death. Children in particular um, are a difficult population. You know, they're oftentimes the center of a culture, the most treasured, you know, small people. And so it's very hard to talk palliative care in children, some of the ethical issues. We've had some difficult conversations, you know, we've had improvs where people are yelling at each other, like, we can't do that. We can't tell people the truth. And then a nurse will stand up and said, yes, I'm tired of lying to my patients. They know they're dying. And so we get to stand, sit back, watch the engagement occur because, you know, like Betty said, we're guests in their country, but it allows for the exchange to occur and for us to just create the safe space for them. So given the region, um, as in the U.S., um, as we've recently experienced also internal conflicts here in the U.S., um, in, in working in the Middle East, are there any safety concerns in your travel for certain countries in that region? Uh, most definitely. And it depends on the year that we travel. Um, you know, I've mostly felt safe in the region. And I have to say that our hosts really go out of the, their way to help us feel safe. Oftentimes, though, we can't say that we're from the United States or from a Western society. And, you know, people will ask where we're from. And we'll, I'll say Sweden or someplace in Europe, um, because there has been a lot of anti-American um, mm -hmm. feelings. The other thing that is challenging is that we're traveling with people from Israel into Muslim countries. And sometimes that can create challenges of just being um, with them together. And so we're cautious and yet again, we put safeguards in place. Our hosts are very gracious. The State Department knows we're there. And the State Department really sponsored a lot of these activities. Um, but during the Palestinian and Israeli conflicts and things, we continue to come together. We continue to put politics aside. We embrace religion. We embrace our differences. And I think that's what this is all about 
is coming together in, in spite of our differences and trying to create a safe area. Oman has been a very safe area for us to gather. And so that's why we've chosen that country. We've had even people from Yemen, um, and like you've seen some of the other parts of the world who have been war-torn. Even during the Iraqi conflict, the Iraqis came. The airport was bombed one night and they were a day late to the training, but they still came. They slept in the airport and traveled to us because they wanted to come. Mm -hmm. It shows the resilience of the people and their desire to get this education back home and to disseminate um, to, to all their people. So they're great learners, love working in the region. Thank you. So given your, your sharing, um, what has been your sort of growth opportunity in, in working with these diverse cultures? And, and how can you help guide us in terms of some of us who are wanting to do um, international work and, and sort of what I hear you say is sort of changing the paradigm of we're going in into these um, countries and, and we have all the resources and knowledge, but then again, you are experiencing um, resilience and, and strength and um, you know, cultural resources that might be important to share some more on. Yeah, so I think the most important thing is um, I learned so many valuable things from my professor, Michael Silverman, and many people might know him, read about him in ASCO and ASCO News from last summer. I mean, he's definitely a world leader in this area. And one of his best words of advice to me was to let them talk let them talk, let them self-discover. And I think when I first went over, and even as an educator, I always thought more was better, you know, pack my lectures full, give them lots of content. They need to know this. They need to know the details. And now I say less is better. Give them a little bit but help them to synthesize, help them to meet in a group, help them to talk through it. And then allowing these liberating structures that we use to allow leaders to emerge for them to self-discover and to carve out lots of chunks in your agenda where you have time to do some of these activities for them to share, for them to kind of discover things on their own. Because when we leave, they have to be the ones that take this forward. So those were all really valuable lessons. So I learned from them each day. Thank you so much, Dr. Bryant. And so I'll turn it over to Dr. Gordon and the leaders of this first global symposium. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ashing, for Thank facilitating. You. And it's been a pleasure to be here today. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Bryant. Thank you, Dr. Farrell and Dr. Ashing for the great session. So a big thank you to all of our esteemed speakers and chairs for the impressive discussion on advancing global oncology and its importance. Finally, I would like to thank our audience who engaged in the conversation and submitted their questions. Uh, you can also visit our website to learn more about the City of Hope Global Oncology. We will also provide this discussion online and we look forward to seeing you in the next Global Oncology event. Thank you very much.